Good evening and welcome to tonight's regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education. Um, I'd ask you to turn off your cell phones. I just turned mine off. And uh, please rise to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> and with that, I'll ask our esteemed secretary to call the roll. President Wasserman. Here. Vice President Brandstad. Here. Secretary Gorton. I'm here. Treasurer Kaminsky. Here. Member Baker. Here. Member McFarland. Here. Member Singer. Here. Thank you. And thank you for everybody coming. Uh, tonight's consent agenda has the minutes from the, the last meeting, uh, staff measure resignations, uh, Title I um, reading books for Plymouth Elementary and East Lawn Elementary, approval of payment school systems bills for February, and uh, purchase orders are also attached for uh, that exceed $3,000. And that is the sum total of the consent agenda. Um, any additions or deletions desired? Seeing none, I'll move into a motion for acceptance. Move to accept consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.4B as identified on the agenda. Support. Moved by Member McFarland and support by Vice President Branstadt. Any other discussion? Seeing none, move into a voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. At this point, we'll move into the portion of our agenda uh, for the public to address the board. We have one person who has uh, so designated in addition, if anybody else cares to, after this person, they're welcome to come to the podium. Uh, Melissa Wall of Greystone Place, uh, if she's here, would come forward. And uh, please limit your comments to five minutes. And you don't have to say where you're from because we have that information. <laughs> Um, I, I guess at this point, I would just like to thank the board. Uh, I did have some items of concern, um, uh, of some concerns from a, a few parents and not getting word back from uh, a few members of, of administration. I, I would say those have been alleviated with some communication that came late Friday, Friday afternoon. So at this point in time, all I would say is that I'm very impressed with the community and with the Board of Education where a parental concern, a public concern, can call on, on a Friday at noon uh, at noon, be put on the agenda to be heard on Monday evening. I uh, kind of applaud that. Uh, I'm impressed with how efficient that is, and and the concerns that existed um, have been communicated with, and and I've been better informed. So thank you, Melissa. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, and and uh, <laughs> anytime. <laughs> we we don't bite usually, and, and we welcome we welcome comments. That's how we hear things. So thank you for coming. Anybody else care to address the board? Going once, twice, okay. We'll move on to the next item of the agenda. Uh, Board of Education matters, and I'll turn it over to Superintendent Cheryl. We have our first Shining Star employee today, and, and that is Mr. Mark Schaefer. If Mark would come up. As Mark's coming up, I'll read these wonderful comments about Mark. Mr. Mark Schaefer began his career with Midland Public Schools in 1988 as a custodian at Midland High School. Before coming to Midland Public Schools, Mr. Schaefer was employed by Mid-Michigan Regional Medical Center. In 1994, Mark received the assistant head custodial position at H.H. Dow High School, and then in July 1995, he received the head custodian position at Cook Elementary School. He worked with staff, students, families, and community at Cook Elementary until, until 2010, when he took over the building manager position at Jefferson Middle School, his current position. The previous supervisor, Mr. Schaefer, remarked, you take great pride in the appearance of Jefferson and it shows. In the winter, while covering both Jefferson and Siebert, you are still able to get all the walks cleared and tackle your job and other responsibilities. You stay on top of any problems that arise and follow through with them. The staff and public relate to you well, and I have had nothing but positive comments about you and your work ethic. This includes all the buildings for which you work. Mark was nominated for the Shining Star Award by three Midland Public School staff members. Among their comments, they wrote, Mr. Schaefer regularly covers Siebert Elementary. He does an outstanding job when he is at Siebert, even though he also does his regular job at Jefferson at the same time. Whether he is opening 
ketchup packets during lunch or scooping a child <laughs> into his arms. That is having a seizure or holding that child's hand until help arrives. Mr. Schaefer is always attending to children as well as the building. The sidewalks are cleared and the school is ready for children. The best part about Mr. Schaefer is that his love for children and willingness to engage with them. He talks with them, helps them in any way he can, and he is always kind and approachable. He always goes above and beyond. Congratulations, Mark. <laughs> this for you. And you get to shake everybody's hand at the table as well. All right, thank you. Second shining star employee is Susan Johnson. If Susan would come up. All right. <laughs> this is almost as bad as reading to the kids. It's so long here, Susan. I don't know. <laughs> Dr. Susan Johnson began her career with Midland Public Schools in July of 2005 as the principal of Mills Elementary School. Before coming to Midland Public Schools, Dr. Johnson served as director of the Mid-Michigan Regional Literacy Training Center through the Saginaw Intermediate School District, where she was involved with literacy training for teachers in nine counties across the Saginaw Valley. Dr. Johnson began a professional career in education in 1994 as a multi-age classroom teacher in the Galesburg Augusta Community School District. In 1995, Susan became a kindergarten and first grade teacher in South Haven Public Schools and moved into a lead teacher reading recovery Title I teacher position for two elementary schools. Susan completed her bachelor's degree in 1990, her master's degree in 1994, and her doctor of philosophy degree in educational leadership in 2010, all from Western Michigan University. Dr. Johnson began her current position of principal of Seabird Elementary in 2010. She leads this building of over 580 students and more than 65 staff members with high standards, mutual respect, and collaborative leadership. We have received a number of nominations for Susan by Midland Public School staff members who work with students in many different roles. Here are just a few of their comments. Her energy level is off the charts. She treats everyone with respect. I have worked 21 years in district and never had such a hard working administrator. She would never ask a person to do anything she wouldn't do. Susan is an amazing administrator. She, she daily goes above and beyond. I have worked for a number of administrators and Susan Johnson is hands down the very best. She works harder than anyone I know. Susan always placing the needs of students at the forefront of everything she does. She thinks outside of the box when it comes to today's lack of resources. She values the opinion and thoughts of students, staff, and families. Working for her is a blessing and a privilege. Her main focus is on the children and getting all the needs met, whether it be academic, social, or emotional. Since we have so many more at-risk students than before, Susan came up with a mentoring program for them. Staff volunteers have lunch twice a month with targeted students to help them work with or just be there to let them know that someone cares about them. She works very hard and never stops trying to think outside the box to help her students be successful. How can you say no volunteering when you see your boss jump right in beside you and get to work? Congratulations, <laughs> Susan. <laughs> Shake everybody's hand. It was flexibility and adaptability, and both of you from building to building, and, and Susan for taking on the challenge of the consolidation of our elementary schools, and how relatively seamlessly that went is a huge credit to you, so thank you. Move on back to Mike. And our first presentation tonight is Midland High School International Baccalaureate CAS program, and we'll have Janet introduce her staff. Uh, no? no? <laughs> yes. <laughs> or you can do it the way you want to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, be happy, I'll be happy to come up and speak. Um, <laughs> actually, this evening we have Carol Duff, who's the IB coordinator. James Pritch, the assistant principal, who actually takes, um, called the cast coordinator, and three fantastic Midland Heights students, um, Sam Rapanis, uh, Caroline Mulvaney, and Elizabeth Lively. So would you please come up? Uh, as 
Janet said, I'm Jill Knapp, and I'm the uh, IB coordinator at Midland High School. And I have the privilege to be here with three of our uh, senior diploma candidates and Candace Pritchett, who is acting now as our CAS coordinator. So I would just like to give you a little bit of background on what CAS is, and then I will turn it over to the important people. So there we go. You might know that the IB diploma program, for a student to get the diploma, they have to take six classes in six different areas. You can see the areas on the wheel. But then they also have to complete the core of the program, those items that are in the center. And those are three things, the theory of knowledge course. They write an extended essay, which is anywhere between 3,500 and 4,000 words on a topic of their choice. And then the creativity action service project which I like to explain kind of like an Eagle Scout project that the students have 18 months to complete, but the students here will, will give you a much better idea of how that works. But So we're talking about the core of the program. All diploma candidates must complete all three components. We also have a new program. Start, we started it last year called the TOK Scholar, and this is to have greater access for our students to those core components of the program. And so any student who takes theory of knowledge, completes the extended essay, and also completes a CAS project is recognized as a TOK scholar. So creativity, action, and service, that's what CAS stands for. And it's really about experiential learning. And the IB, as well as I think probably all of us, realize that learning takes place outside of the classroom walls. And this is the perfect way uh, for the students to learn in that way. We are focused on eight learner outcomes. As you can see, I won't, I won't read them to you. And the students will probably talk a little bit about them. But they need to devise activities where they can show growth in each of these areas at some point, again, over their two-year um, process. So now, Sam Rapanis will show you what she's up to. Samantha Rapanis, and my cast project is titled A Simple Smile Can Brighten Anyone's Day. And my focus is doing anything in the, in the community with the elderly in any way, shape, or form to help them. So the two main things that are part of my cast project is I'm a volunteer at Mid-Michigan Regional Medical Center, and I'm a candy striper. And what that entails is you deliver their papers, you deliver meals, you take their meal orders, and then when you need to, you deliver them flowers or cards if they come through your front desk. And you have to mandatory work two shifts a month, and they're two-hour shifts. But I usually strive to work once every weekend. And so I've been doing this since eighth grade. And then I also volunteer through King's Daughters Assisted Living. And I visit a 96-year-old woman named Mrs. Elizabeth Bolton who has no family in the city of Midland. They all either live extremely high in the UP or <coughs> way down south. And my main purpose of going there is to provide her with companionship and to provide her with a friend who can give her something to look forward to every week as she goes to dialysis quite a bit to try and maintain her health. And while I'm there, the main things we've done so far is I've, she's taught me how to make tamari balls, which I'll show you pictures of here soon. She's taught me how to do some wheat feeding, which I'll show you as well. And we've also just played some games with other of her friends that are there. So in the hospital, I've been working here since eighth grade. And lately, we've started to revamp the program, making it younger and more available to many age groups in the public. And I've also been part of and named one of the leaders in the steering committee for the student volunteers, focusing on how to make the program better and how to help improve the efforts that we do in helping the food ambassadors and the other staff at the hospital help the patients in the Georgia stay. And the main purpose of doing the volunteering at the hospital is the fact that all you're trying to do is help out and make the patients feel as welcome as they possibly can, even though their circumstances are not what they deem ideal. While I'm at King's Daughter's Home, 
I lived with the lady in the middle, and on the left is what would be called a tamari ball. And you use a styrofoam ball, and you wrap it in thread, and then you take pins, and you design a pattern. And then you pick a different color of thread and follow those. And I'd just like to point out, she's 96 years old, and she doesn't have the most nimble of fingers, yet she's showed me some of the ones she's been able to do in the last year, and they've been beyond anything more intricate than I'll ever be able to do. <laughs> <laughs> and on the right is one of the projects we've recently done through Wheat Weaving, and it's a heart <coughs> for Valentine's Day. And you take six pieces of wheat, which she's dried out and prepared for months, and you just weave them in a certain pattern until you get your desired shape. So throughout this um, CAST project, I've had a couple main goals. It's basically to help me further my possibility of getting into the school of my dreams, which I have recently done, getting into the School of Nursing at Mi University of Michigan, as well as it also has help solidify what I want to do with my future in that I want to become a nurse to be able to further show how my personality and my willing to help others can benefit and need people in the community. And throughout doing my CAS project, it's given me a new outlook on what I can personally accomplish. It showed me that I know how to adapt to different situations, whether it's dealing with certain patients in the hospital who still don't understand that I'm just there to help them and they treat me like I'm a nurse who controls their livelihood there as well or whether it's not or whether or if whether or not it's just the fact that when I go to visit Mrs. Olson she sometimes is not in the very best condition to do whatever we had planned and so I have to adapt and I'm just there to help make her day easier whether it's just recommending instead of doing this how about we do this to make it easier on you so you don't have to go around and make everything like that and it's also showed me how the fact that my willingness to volunteer in the community has helped further my possibility of getting into the University of Michigan because it shows my um, interest in the pathway that I want to take. And at this time, I'd also like to mention the fact that my grandma has also been a huge person in the process of this as she's been a volunteer. And she initially introduced me into the program. And along with her and my parents, they've been the initial like driving force behind pursuing this and making sure this is the one thing that I don't give up no matter how busy my schedule is. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Caroline Mulvaney and this I'm is Elizabeth Ladwig. <laughs> IV diploma program as well. And our CAS project is focused on the environment and going green. This is a picture of Elizabeth and I and a couple other environmental club students over the summer. And we have been interested in environmentalism and going green throughout our entire lives. And our sophomore year, we, we decided to start an official environmental club and so we're going to go into more depth about what we've done with that. Yeah. Okay, so um, helping the environment was already something that me and Caroline really cared about and it was something that we were already really interested in and so the CAS program allows students to take something that they care about and to incorporate that into their IB program and so these are all of the um, like learning goals of the IB program. And so I think that the CAS program helps to um, keep students balanced. And so even though the IB program is really rigorous academically, we need to also focus on extracurriculars and things that we really care about, um, like for me and Caroline, helping the environment. And so the CAS project is a big service project in which we have the opportunity to um, go more in depth into something that really matters to us. And I think that that also teaches us to be caring and to care about our community and our school. Okay, this is one of the <coughs> uh, main things that we've focused on in environmental club. And that is making Midland High School an official green school. <coughs> so we've done um, a lot of things in order to be able to achieve this. So we're gonna um, just focus on a few of our main activities. 
Okay, so we already talked a little bit about how Caroline and I started the environmental club at Midland High sophomore year, and we've been able to use environmental club to uh, further um, activities for our CAS project, and so um, a lot of the activities that we've done have been through environmental club, and we've had other members help us with that, so this is a picture of us doing park cleaning, which we'll talk about later. Park because it was like pretty close. Uh, it's pretty close to Midland High, and a lot of students when they go out for lunch, you know, they'll they'll be walking, and um, you know, sometimes trash will fall and stuff like that. So we, <laughs> so we decided to go here, like because I mean, trash would inevitably get over to Virginia Park, and we didn't want to portray Midland High as that kind of school. So we're like, well, let's do Virginia Park because. Um, that's pretty close. And we kind of um, cleaned up the surrounding areas as well. Okay, this is um, another one of our major activities. Uh, we we kind of, we wanted to get the word out about environmentalism to the younger generation, you know, because high schoolers tend to be like, I don't know, more solidified in their beliefs and everything. And a lot of people are kind of like, oh, the environment, we don't have to, we don't have to worry about that. It's not our problem, but me and Elizabeth are, like our thinking was a little bit different because we're like, well, it's, it's our home. It's where we live. We need to protect it and make sure we're living sustainable and stuff like that. So we decided to start the environmental education program for elementary students. So we go there um, every few weeks. We contact elementary school principals ahead of time and we travel over and we have um, a presentation set up for the kids. We talk to them about how they can help live sus more sustainably by recycling and we give them tips on what they can do at home. And we also do crafts with them dealing with uh, recycle recyclable materials, showing them that um, new things can be made out of um, someone else's garbage. And basically, and we just end with a quiz and a couple fun games and it's just really nice to see them really enthusiastic about the environment and recycling. Those are just some more pictures of us um, helping out the kids with their crafts and that's me talking to them about the importance of being eco-friendly. Okay and then yeah the environment um, the elementary school presentations were probably our, that was probably our favorite project. I think it was just it was really cool to be able to see little kids get so excited about helping the environment and I think me and Caroline were really surprised because we weren't expecting them to be so excited about it but after our first presentation the kids were jumping up and down to answer the questions to our trivia game so yeah. that was really cool and um, yeah so we already talked a little bit about um, how we adopted Virginia Park and so we that's something that we're going to continue to work on this spring and so that's been one of the ways that we're trying to help the community and not just our school. Right. And another thing that we've done that I want to mention is we adopted, we financially adopted an endangered species last year. Uh, we adopted the snow leopard. So we had um, a coin drive for that and we basically send money not to not to like physically adopt one <laughs> snow leopard, but just to like <laughs> so that it will go to the, um, the foundation to make sure they're a protected species. Okay, thank you. It's been my privilege to have the opportunity to oversee the uh, CAS projects and these uh, two projects are just examples of the wonderful things uh, that these students are uh, working on. We have had projects that have uh, helped to make all of Midland High uh, more beautiful. Uh, students have uh, learned to plant different varieties of perennials and annuals and have uh, done some mulching projects and weeding and also some projects on the inside of the building. In addition, we have had partnerships with vet clinics and as uh, Samantha mentioned earlier, uh, the hospital. We also have several students that help out in the elementaries and 
and our mentors to many students. And as you could uh, tell from the students' projects, uh, the, the main goal is to make sure that the CAS projects are meaningful, purposeful, and they need to be sustained over the course of their junior and senior year. A couple years ago, the guideline was that the students were to give approximately 150 hours um, towards their project. We no longer count hours, but that's a general guideline that the students use. And these students, and currently we have 27 at Midland High that have CAS projects and are involved in the IB program um, or, uh, as juniors and seniors, but these students also are highly involved in other um, activities inside the school and in the community as well. So the CAS project is, is their main focus. Um, as Ms. Neff mentioned, it's likened to a Eagle Scout project. But the key thing that um, I feel uh, comes from all of this is Midland has given to our students many, many wonderful opportunities. And um, this is a way for our students, this generation, to give back to coming tonight I, I have a comment I'm, I'm really impressed with how students that are going through the IB uh, program they're having some experiences with different generations and I think that's part supports the worldview and being learners and when you get out in the world you're gonna have to work with so many different uh, not as just team building and, and work as groups but just with the different generations and and uh, kind of the part that uh, Ms. Critches was talking about with uh, uh, giving back. I think about how the kids are ambassadors out in the community and doing things, and that really is a great image for uh, Midland Public Schools. So it's really a great program. I agree with that completely. I, I have one question um, to any of you, um, really. Is there an ability or are there plans to carry on your projects uh, beyond your high school careers? In other words, is somebody kind of pick up where you, you know, will eventually leave off? Um, I know that at the hospital they have um, students filtering in and out of all the programs and when I'm in May is when you end your process as being a student volunteer at the hospital but then further on from that you have opportunities to be still affiliated at the hospital through volunteering as an adult and I know some of the opportunities are volunteering in the oncology department as well as in the gift shop that they hold at the hospital and I know that my um, boss at the hospital, she's encouraged many of the seniors graduating this year to pursue those in the future. Great. Yeah. And then um, with our CAS projects, uh, we hope that the Environmental Club will continue for a long time, hopefully. And uh, also that Midland High will keep uh, taking care of Virginia Park because it's right by Midland High. And so that would be good if we could kind of clean up after ourselves. This is where Candace is going to be instrumental because because of her connection with the juniors and the seniors and then the incoming sophomores, she's able to place kids and give kids suggestions. And so if, if we know that these seniors are leaving and we need an environmental club president, Candace would be in the position to say, hey, we want this as your CAS project and see if there's any interest. So hopefully those things will carry on. Fantastic. Thank you. Can you give us just a few, um, just tell us a little bit of what some of the other projects are also, just just the nature of them, maybe. I mean, you don't have to go into detail or anything, but just um, some of the We others. had several that help out, um, uh, several students that help out at East Lawn and uh, Carpenter uh, with some tutoring. We have a student um, that is uh, actively involved in volunteering at uh, Grace A. Dow Library. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the vet clinic we have a project um, regarding MHS beautification that actually has been a project that has been carried on. Um, this is the third year the students have done it, so it was a project that was passed on from a student uh, that graduated last year, and now a, a group of students have, have inherited the project, so to speak. 
those are just some of the the main ones that that have occurred this past year thank you do you encourage them to work in groups or like I know oh, you, you know Sam did hers and then there's the group of two is there a limit to the size is there no uh, originally though it I believe was designed more for it to be a single student but in partnership as far as you know the outcomes and what may be you know learned and gained from the process but um, I, I think it's been beneficial for these students to work together uh, brings different perspectives and then to pass that on hopefully to other students so I, I think it's a win-win uh, to be able to join together I love to your passion in each of your presentations it was uh, exciting and uh, it's it's really fun to see that you're following your passion in in these projects that you're pursuing and I could feel the energy that you brought to it and it's it's great it's a pride spot for Midland High as well as uh, the whole district so thanks for your hard work and Sam thank you for reaching out and bringing a little joy to somebody's life mm -hmm. you'll never understand what that meant to them and and to the other two I'm impressed with something um, Usually you find people, uh, I shouldn't say this too loud, oftentimes people who care about causes, care about someone else fixing a cause, something that that other person created, and demanding they do something about their situation. What I'm impressed about your project is you're taking care of your own backyard. You know, you saw a situation, I'm not saying you created it, that's created by your peers, et cetera, et cetera, and took control of it and saying, we're gonna fix our own problem. And that's, that's very important uh, to, to do that. So thank you very much. I think that's true. And I really like the way you involved younger kids in that too, to really get them thinking that way at, at a young age. I think that's really great, a real good thing to do. And I would just say, you can just feel your enthusiasm. And, I, and with some of the other students in their projects, I think that is so neat because you're doing something you're so passionate about. And uh, it, it impacts other people so, so positively. So thank you. And I hope tonight on television, you've inspired some of our middle schoolers to take on the IB Diploma Challenge as they go forward. Mm -hmm. I hope parents who are watching this will understand some of the value that comes from that. So thank you. And our next presentation is East Lawn Community School Model. And Bonnie, are you going to introduce or start it? Thank you. East Lawn's happy to be here tonight. We were here about a year ago to share with you our launch and our goals for our community school model. This is going to fall. There we go. Um, so we're back tonight with our community school model team to share with you some data and some results from a year in our uh, community school project. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Shannon Blasey. Are we all coming up at once? Or? OK, and Kara <laughs> Eddy Resource Room, Chris Corbett, CHS, Jackie Warner, Community Mental Health, Nikki Coleman, first grade teacher, Christy Henniger, fifth grade teacher. We have back here Lindsay Cook. She's our, one of our nurses. We have a couple nurses. And Shannon, I'll let you take over. Thank you for having us back tonight. We're excited to share these results that um, have happened over the course of a year. Um, the East Lawn Community School model um, began February 28th last year. And actually, this team, this list of team members here, um, it started out with a small one or two of us, and then it's grown since then to this wonderful list of people that contribute. Um, Bonnie Westervelt, our principal, myself, um, Aaron Flamont, our family intervention specialist, Chris Corbett, who's here tonight from Department of Human uh, services, that should say services, sorry about that. Uh, Dana Carley um, is our parent and community resource coordinator. Joe Turnwald and Lindsay Cook are our nurses. And Jackie Warner is our youth intervention specialist from community mental health. And then of course our Eastland teachers and our staff members. Um, how Eastland Community School began, actually back in 2012 in October, Jackie Warner, Diana LaRue, Michelle Bell, and I um, were asked to go to pay a visit to Sibley Elementary in Grand Rapids. 
they have the community school model as well, and we were there to see how that worked. We were able to sit into a, in a meeting and really listen to how they coordinated and collaborated amongst all the team members to see what kind of things they could bring to families and um, students who had attendance problems. Um, after visiting and reviewing the community school protocol, uh, Judge Allen with the 42nd Family and Probate Court discussed the truancy issues with Midland Public Schools and Bullet Creek districts. And the recommendation was to implement the community school model um, at Floyd Elementary and East Lawn Elementary Schools. Um, to continue on, the importance of focusing, or the importance of the community school model is to focus on really a culture change in thinking about how it's very important to get the child to school on time every day. And um, it's really a shift, it's a shift of thinking. It's, it's putting in the forefront of every parent's um, mind in the morning to make sure they do those phone calls in to tell us if their child is sick um, or not or where they might be and um, also just making sure that education is a priority. Um, and then eventually Floyd and East Lawn were officially chosen also due to our poverty and our truancy rates. Just to give you a nationwide focus regarding community schools, um, there are over 49 states that implement the community school model and there are over 5,000 schools across the country in operation, and this number is growing. Um, according to the U.S. Department of Education, um, it was stated that this model is the only proven data-based model that increases attendance and increases graduation rates. For more information, uh, for anybody that would like to research this, um, the communityschools.org um, community is a great place to go for additional resources and understanding about this program. <clears throat> the different functions of the community school model um, is to bring together various resources for the families and really break down those barriers for students and families that enable students to get to school on time every day. Um, and we'll go into some of those reasons why they might not be coming to school later on and what we have done for them. Um, the increase in attendance rates coincides with an increase in academic achievement and um, the East Lawn Community School team uh, we meet weekly to put together information from all of our various resources and expertise um, regarding the student or the family. And the team then helps make a plan with the parents regarding the next steps that we might need to take or which referrals we might need to give to outside agencies um, or possibly even home visits um, and really just help the families. And then Chris Corbett's going to um, introduce a little bit more about our model. So just to kind of compare where we were last year when we started and some of the numbers before and where we are now currently, um, we're officially a year into this. Um, we've had about three weeks to compare kind of side by side from with the program up and running um, and then from where that was last year to now. So uh, for the 2012-2013 school year, we had a 57% truancy rate. We define that as uh, students who had 10 or more absences, leave earlies, and tardies. So all of those are the same value. Whenever that amount gets to 10, we say, okay, you're truant. Every district and every school system has their own definition of truancy. And the state of Michigan, hopefully with a little help from Judge Allen, will finally have a set definition of truancy that we can all agree on and enforce this uh, statewide. Um, and this year, uh, we currently sit at 25.19 at that level right now. Granted, it's February when there's a few months left, but uh, we're hoping to improve on those numbers as we go. Uh, for the 2012-2013 school year, uh, we had 87 students with 10 or more absences. So that's just absences. That's absences, not tardies and leaves early. Uh, this year we have eight right now. So wow. make it mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, and also, October 9th uh, was a huge day for us at East Lawn. We have some people in the building who've been there a while, and we can't remember a day where we ever had all of our kids in class, every seat filled. So we were down to, as we're crunching the attendance that day, Sydney Krause, one of our office assistants, recognized, like, oh my gosh, we have one kid left. We're only missing one kid, so she gets on the phone, like she does every day. Every day she kind of goes down the list, you know, kids who aren't here, and she calls it. Like, oh, yeah, they weren't feeling okay, you know, and she's like, well, can he really come to school? And sure enough, the kid's in his seat 15 minutes later, and we have all of our kids in school. Wow. Uh, you know, 
<laughs> great day at East Lawn. So, uh, yeah, That's 100% amazing. attendance for that day. Uh, you know, and just, you know, Cindy and our, our entire office staff and really everybody mm -hmm. in the building has really uh, helped out in emphasizing that. Get to school every day and on time. Um, for the week uh, last year from, I should say, uh, from March to June was when we first implemented community school model. We started at the beginning of the year, or at the middle of the year last year. Um, we were averaging 76 absences per week. So that's from last year, March to June. Uh, this year, we're at 49 absences per week. That's our average. So we're making gains there. And just kind of a, um, you know, like a live snapshot, okay? So um, the past week, March 17th to March 21st, that Monday through Friday period, uh, last year we had 102 absences for that whole week. Uh, last week we had 51. So cut that number in half exactly. I'm not making it up. You guys can audit it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, huge, huge improvements. Um, and so Shannon's going to explain a little more about how our model works, how we kind of sit down every week, go through the weekly attendance, and we can see the kids coming down the tracks and um, classify them and kind of prioritize um, which ones we need to um, you know, contact the families and reach out. Uh, right now we have a green, yellow, um, red system. And what that means is zero to three absences, um, leave earlies or, or tardies. Um, we provide incentives for families and for students. Um, and we'll go into a variety of what that means um, later on. Um, four to six absences, leave earlies or tardies. Um, the incentives are put on hold until we see improvement in the attendance record. And then seven to 10 or more. Now seven is important because that triggers the first truancy letter to go out to parents to indicate that we would like to have a, an attendance agreement meeting with them. 10 is deemed truant. And then unfortunately, sometimes it escalates from there. Um, and incentives are also on hold until um, improvement is shown in attendance. Um, with the first attendance agreement meeting, um, I'm the truancy officer for the building, so I hold these meetings regularly. And I, I, my main purpose is to find out the reasons, um, and then as far as why they're truant, and then also help them create a plan um, to help improve that attendance record. Um, it's a very, I would say, relaxed type of um, meeting. I, as first thing, when the parents walk in the door, I'm thanking them for coming. And I tell them, this is just about how to help. Um, in some cases, we're helping with transportation. In some cases, we're helping getting um, people connected to um, insurance so they can take their children to the doctor. It, it, the, the list varies. Um, but that's what I sit down and do. Um, and then if we see about two to four marks after that, then we have um, a community school model meeting. So we have all of the folks that were listed on the first slide about with our team sitting around the table, parents invited to, to, um, to that meeting. And we continue to maybe rebuild that plan and then offer additional resources that um, might be necessary. If we see an additional roughly two to four marks again from that point, then the um, information is referred to Diana LaRue, our truancy supervisor over at the courthouse. And um, again, she's also there um, to help uh, strategize ways to um, offer different resources to the plan that might already be in place, maybe additional resources that we weren't, be able, we weren't able to provide or additional steps that we could take. And the whole goal of all of these different steps is to keep families out of the prosecutor's office. Um, we know that it's, um, uh, we have more emphasis now at the elementary level on attendance and truancy. And the reason for that is so that these um, habits can form at a young age for the students and really at a young age for the young parents to learn that it's important to have children in school as much as possible so that they can have access to their curriculum and their education. Um, when we do discuss these uh, different things in the meeting, we make sure parents know that we would love to have medical notes come in um, and I, we extend that to any well-being note, whether it's court, counseling, or anything else that the student might need assistance with for their well-being. And these marks are not counted toward their truancy attendance record. We just don't tally those. We want the students to be taken care of. And actually, we go, we also know that sometimes we have students that are sick, and they just need to stay home, and they won't always go to the doctor's office. So they can call me at school, and then they can explain um, 
what their child's um, chronic symptoms are, and then I can even excuse that um, as another way of just you know opening the communication doors and making sure that we've got it documented just just so. Um, and also, funerals are not counted for insurance. We ser and there are some other reasons as well, um, in some cases very unique reasons, um, but we want to make sure that's clear. Some of the common reasons for truancy, um, waking up late is topping the list, and that's an easy fix. That's something that I just say, okay, we can go ahead and back that clock up a little bit when you wake up. Um, that'll get you out, out of the door um, a little sooner. In some cases, I've offered alarm clocks, and they've been needed. Um, the second thing is uh, transportation problems. Um, we've connected families to various resources in the community to help fix cars. Um, and to get people on a list for cars. Some people just don't have transportation, and obviously that makes it more difficult for, their, uh, for parents to get their children to school. Um, there's uh, the, third, the third category is the other category, and this um, really has quite a, a list, about 19 or more different varieties of reasons, but um, I would say parent custody and convenient for convenience sake um, top the, the variety list there. Um, and then uh, medical issues, whether there's no insurance coverage or there's claims of disease or health problems. And so we need to have a discussion about that. Um, lice. And then also additional barriers include substance abuse, mental health issues, and homelessness. Here are some of our responses to the truancy reasons that we uncovered during these meetings. Community Mental Health, um, Jackie Warner, she's screened 18 students so far and offers guidance to parents on mental health issues and how to access help. Sometimes it's just a matter of navigating the system and knowing who to call um, for different reasons. And then um, Department of Human Services, um, I know Chris personally has assisted families in avoiding evictions, homelessness, um, electrical and water utility turnoffs and provides connections to food resources and assists families in obtaining um, medical insurance for their children. Our <coughs> nurses, on average, they see about 50 students um, for the three days that they are in our building. They're not full-time. There they're, are two of them, but they are a part-time uh, deal. And um, they assist with matters that include acute illness, medication management, uh, psychosocial aspects of nursing, and um, uh, with students and their parents. They do lice checks and they help in um, child protection issues. Um, and actually, our, nurse, our nurses, they had to team up today. They had, I think they saw over 30, 30 different students just today alone. Um, our family intervention specialists, uh, both Erin and Dana are family intervention specialists and they assist in um, emotional and behavior crisis intervention. Um, they've seen over 130 students in the 2013 school year, and um, I know Erin sees 58 students weekly on a regular basis. Um, they help families and staff members to provide, excuse me, to um, problem solve ways to decrease behavioral and emotional problems at home and school. A lot of times there's a crisis that erupts, behaviors crop up in the classroom, and we need to find out what's happening. Erin um, is um, there, and uh, so is Dana, to help figure that out, and the idea is to get the student back in the classroom, to be able to focus back on education, um, but we know that we have to tend to some of these emotional issues first before they can concentrate on their education. Um, it's a pretty big job, as you can see, um, so we've reached out to many community organizations, and they've been fantastic in helping us. Um, anything from contributing to um, getting beds for our kids, um, running food drives for us, any kind of supplies or donations that we need for our incentives um, have been, the community has been outstanding. Everybody from the Millinery Community Foundation to Dan Dan the Mattress Man, um, you know, I could name several. Um, so we've had 92 individual incentives for kids that have been distributed since uh, September 2013. So. Um, kind of go more into that. Usually, what we try and do is maybe a weekly drawing every week or monthly drawings for kids to just kind of re-emphasize that being in the school every day and on time is important. A lot of times those students that had those needs when they come to the attendance meetings, the parents say, well, I didn't go to school very often when I was in school. So 
um, that transfers down to their children. So they're not getting that emphasis at home. So anything we can do with, um, you know, just little trinkets or gift certificates to local restaurants or anything, ice cream, candy, whatever, um, you know, just get the kids excited. Oh, well, thanks for, you know, their surprise, you know, because they're now getting in the habit of it um, and just to reinforce that. And we also had school-wide assemblies as well um, in large groups. We had uh, members of the Midland High football team, the band, and the cheerleading staff come and do like a miniature pep assembly for our kids. Um, you know, for all the kids that have perfect attendance for an entire month, and you know, they see the football players in their uniforms, and they're just like, whoa, wow. And then the football players say, you know, we have to come to practice every day, and we have to get good grades to play. Just more people that can emphasize that role of showing up every day on time, commitment, hard work. Um, you know, for people they look up to is important. Um, so that's one of the parts. Um, and as, the, as we've mentioned, we've had um, resources with Midland Area Homes and helping us find housing, um, you know, the food drives, just emotional support. We have several people who come in and volunteer, like lunchbox learners, and just volunteer that personal time with our kids, um, you know, kind of an intimate environment. Um, also, uh, the community support for the East Long Community School model has been tremendous. Um, you know, I can't say enough from people who just drop off mittens and hats and gloves um, you know, we've done coat drives for our kids. Just the generosity of the community, always keeping, you know, East Lawn in the back of their mind and saying, hey, we have this extra stuff. Could your kids use it and absolutely find a use for it? Um, so it's been tremendous. Um, we also offer parent programming um, for our parents, obviously. Um, you know, because we just don't want to, it's kind of a, it's a whole family situation. We just don't want to put a band-aid on it with the kids. We want to help the parents, too, give them some tools that they might not have um, you know, to help them deal with issues their kids have. So, you know, we've had technology nights. Um, as you guys know, our district's moving more to the uh, web-based content and things. We have parents who are, don't have computers in their home, but they can get it on their smartphone. And so we show them how to access those things. eSchool Plus, Moodle. Um, you know, we've had parent resource night where we had over 20 agencies in our gym at parent-teacher conferences. So parents could come in, and we have all these agencies offering their support. And, you know, they might not, um, you know, ask for help through me, but they can, those resources are there, um, and they can seek those out. Um, Co-parenting, raising cooperative kids, coping with anger for kids, ADHD in your child, um, these are programs that Aaron and Jackie Warner put on as well, common sense parenting, um, you know, all sorts of things that we offer for our parents and families to help them in school. And so we've mentioned the incentives before, um, you know, the individual incentives for the kids, and then the big assembly, classroom stuff. Um, we're moving towards um, including more kids because we want more kids to experience the success. It doesn't do us any good if, you know, the kids who are chronically late and absent and tardy all the time, uh, we're trying to find ways to get them involved as well. Um, you know, so we want them to experience the success and then want to attain that again. Um, it's very important, uh, as you guys know, with balancing budgets and setting um, stuff like that, that all of our incentives are community donations. So in my position, um, it's through DHS, so all of this is either through grants, Title I funding, which is already allocated, or community donations, so uh, there's no expense on the taxpayer. Um, so all of it's community donated, and again, I can't say enough, um, you know, our community has been very, very generous. My name is Kara Eddy, I'm a special education teacher. Um, we are still evolving as uh, per our community school model. This is just entering into our uh, second year. Um, we are looking at doing new incentive ideas. Teachers are piloting a community pro approach in the classroom as we're entering into our first year of um, PYP. We want to incorporate that into our monthly incentives. Um, we have had the lowest numbers of tardies ever. We just recently started to pilot this new approach. As you see the, the little ones up in the corner of the picture there, um, we had March's reading month and our theme was camping. And they came in and our, our goal was to minimize tardies and each classroom was given a goal and the kids when they came in, they would put a little lightning bug right by the jar so that they could see, I'm here, I, I'm a valued member of my classroom and our celebration. Every kid in that classroom when they um, came in, they would put their lightning bug right on that jar. Um, so we've had the lowest numbers of tardies. Prior to the tardy initiative, which we did this month, we were averaging about 45 tardies a week. Since the tardy initiative, we're averaging about 35 
tardies per week, so we've still got some work to do, but we've definitely decreased. We're connecting with our ECSM, our community school model, with the PYP, Primary Years Program, that will be implemented next year to reinforce the sense of community. Um, we are focusing on every kid is so important into our uh, classroom and the celebrations that they all have to offer. Um, we are targeting families on the red that are at risk and offer incentives based on improvement in attendance records. Currently, we give um, a lot of time, we give about two weeks of perfect attendance and we'll move them um, into the celebration round. So even if they're on red, they have a chance to get back in with the celebrations and the initiatives that we're doing. Um, and we're also looking at uh, combining the green and the yellow so that more people, again, are a part of our celebrations. Um, we're continuing to build partnerships with the communities. As we said before, upwards towards 60 community um, programs are involved with what we're doing here. Just a few things that parents have said um, based on what we've done here at Eastlawn. Uh, wow, I didn't know you could help me provide with connections to daycare. That's huge. I feel like I won the lottery, referring to a parent resource night. My family loved going to the spirit hockey game. We have given away spirit hockey tickets as an incentive. Uh, we've never been there before, and we're proud of the improvements our son has made with the attendance that he has. Thank you for the tickets. The East Lawn staff is very encouraging. My child loves coming to school and learn. That, um, that quote gives me goosebumps in itself. It's just the enjoyment of being right at school. My son and our family have worked so hard to improve his attendance. He has perfect attendance for the first time in elementary school. We are so proud of him. Think of the impact that this has on an elementary school student going into older grades. Um, I'm going to pass it off to some of our general ed teachers that will share some stories. Hi, my name is Christy Hanegar. I'm a fifth grade teacher, and um, I just wanted to give a little testimonial about how our students are buying into this as well. Um, this year I have a student who had extreme issues with truancy. Um, he was just one step away from the prosecutor's office. And um, so we, so the last couple of months we've been working a lot with him and his family. And with this incentive that we're doing this month that Kara just mentioned with putting the fireflies into the jar with the tardies, uh, one day last week, he, I was just getting ready to take attendance. The bell hadn't, the second bell hadn't rung yet. And he came flying into my room and he was like, I'm here, I'm not late, right? I said, no, you're not late. And um, just to see that he cared enough not to be late is, is huge because he and his family have had many, many issues with him just really disliking school and not wanting to be there at all. In fact, um, we had a lock-in Friday night with the kids and they spent the night there and he came, so he actually wanted to sleep at school. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Nikki Coleman, and I'm a first grade teacher and just wanted to give you a little preview of what we are trying to help with our first grade kiddos. I have a student who would be floating around that yellow and red. His family has been severely truant as far as tardies, not so much absences. So the other day he came in and he was a little bit grumbly, a little Eeyore, you know, little Eeyore syndrome for the Monday, first Monday of school. And so I said, hey, you know, you're all right. You're here. You're on time. And he said, I'm on time. I'm on time. I get to put the yellow firefly in the jar. Yes, you're on time. So, he, you know, what a celebration for him. Just so, even with the younger children, you think maybe it's a little less out of their locus of control, but a positive attitude goes a long way for parents who are trying to get out the door on time, hoping that we can curb that to make the older grades go much easier. Concludes our presentation. Do you have any follow-up questions for any of us? <laughs> I'm sure that <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll let everybody else go first. Pam. The data, a lot of times we see data and uh, there's jumps and improvements and you celebrate them, but wow, your, your jumps are huge and uh, that's very exciting. And it's exciting to see the collaborative effort of this group as well as how you're engaging your parents at the school and the kids. and. That is really exciting. I'll go next. I was excited when you guys came out last year about the about the program, and Judge Allen was here, and um, I know you went out to Grand Rapids, looked at some uh, best practices were out there, but I think you 
had to adopt it to work better in Midland and tweaked it and improved it. And uh, this is so, so characteristic of Midland, looking at uh, everybody across the community, I mean, all different organizations, and um, this is what makes Midland Public Schools great. And you know, we go as, as a board of education, we have uh, many, many signs in all of our meetings of support, and it's, it's really such a, a great, uh, great uh, representation of Midland, and it's really great to have you guys from all different uh, specialties and being able to work together in, in a disciplinary fashion. So thank you. Anybody else? Do, do you know if Lloyd is having the same types of um, successes? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Lloyd's a little, it's a little unique because our, um, most of our students are bused in, so usually our tardy numbers are lower because mm. a lot of times if they miss the bus, well, they don't show up early, they just don't come to school. So their absences are a little bit higher, but that uh, the improvement's universal. Uh, you know, our tardies, our absences to um, the average numbers, I think we're at a 30, per, uh, th 30 uh, kid absent improvement so for the weekly averages. So uh, yes, seeing the same results there. So are your kids that are late, is it because they don't live in an area where they get busing to school? You had, I mean, that kind of prompted that when you said Floyd, a lot of the kids bus, and I know at East Lawn, you, you have the Longview group, which I would assume would all get busing, and then you have, you know, the East Lawn group, which I would kind of assume probably doesn't. So is there a correlation there? You know, that's, it's actually a mixed group, because sometimes students miss the bus. Mm -hmm. And then therefore, you know, any bus that comes late, we don't count that as tardy. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got our, our walkers, or people that are out of the walking zone, but not quite in the busing zone, so mm -hmm. they're getting driven to school by their parents. So it's a mixture. Okay. Congratulations to all of you on your great success there. That's amazing. I remember reading, uh, getting the email back in October that you had a perfect attendance day. I thought that is the most exciting thing. That's just amazing. Thank you. And, and I'll have a comment. Um, <coughs> a couple of things. One is, you know, you, you show the data. Data is astronomical. The data says everything, <laughs> but all those data points are our kids and parents. And so it was really good to hear your stories, different stories about kids and parents. And I'm just a firm believer that you can never change attitudes without changing behaviors. And, and you're changing behaviors, not only changing behaviors of children, you're changing behaviors of parents. And it starts stemming the multi-generational cascade. And I'm just so pleased with that. And I, I just hope we can continue doing this because there'll be a day, maybe, maybe there'll even be a day where you don't have to do it. And uh, I just can't wait and to, to keep plugging away at this problem and it's a great solution. So thank you for your effort. Thank you. All right. <laughs> We're going to move on uh, to some action items, and Mike, turn to you. Uh, I think so. Linda, you want it, or you want me to go answer it? Okay. Um, as it says there, we only have three people who are authorized to sign checks. And that's the assistant superintendent, superintendent, and associate superintendent of finance. So with the change from eventually of Linda to Bob, we're looking to get ahead of that and have Mr. Cooper be authorized to be on that check. Okay. Uh, entertain a motion. I move we approve action item 4.4. Four. 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 Okay. Moved by Ms. Branson, supported by Ms. Singer. Any questions or comments? I don't know, Bob. This is a big stretch. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot of money you have to hand uh, on there. I have signature. to think about this for a minute. <laughs> no, thank you. Totally trustworthy. I'm not concerned one iota. Okay, no other further comments or questions. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Item 4.5 is um, so we adopted the NEOLA policy to come in full compliance with the law. But as we knew that some of the policies would need some small tweaking as far as the actual practice that occurs in our district. And so these are the first set of many that you're gonna see with small ch uh, changes to the policy. Motion. I move approval of uh, item 4.5 for the revisions to the NEOLA policy. And second. We got a motion on a second. Any question or comment? Just, just a comment with going through those, uh, Mr. Char, that a lot of that was just grammatical and, I mean, tiny little tweaks to the policy. So it's it's good that we're keeping that up to date. I know it's 
I think part of it was technology and um, you know provisions or regulations and things. So it's it's nice to keep up us up because those policy manuals tend to be outdated really quick, especially if they're related to technology and other things. So yeah. Okay, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. And I'll hand it to Ms. Klein for mid-year budget adjustments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, they knew, it was, they knew it was coming up. <laughs> clear the room. You did clear the room. Oh, well. Uh, this is our first budget revision for the 2013-14 school year. There will be one more at the end of the year on, uh, I believe, June 23rd will be the the final meeting there. Uh, just to give you a sense of where we are in time, we began with our board workshop last year in April on the 28th, brought the budget to you, we held a public hearing on June 9th, took action on it on June 23rd, and we are doing our mid-year revision today, and we'll take final action on it in June, and then it'll be audited in July, and we'll be rolling into the next year. Uh, Somewhat busy, but a lot of important information here. Uh, we started the year with 76 million in budgeted revenues, and at that time, I told you that historically I was able to track just under 1% of variance in revenues from the original budget to the final. Uh, and that has, we've had revenues come in, and I'll go over the details of those, but the 13 14 budgeted revenues are actually up almost 1.8 so at this point, for projection purposes, I've removed any additional variance. There is the possibility of some variance because we don't have numbers on uh, adjustments from the ESA on the Act 18, the Special Education Millage, or the Enhancement Millage. So that would continue to be an unknown. But I think most of the changes that take place have. So at this point, there's, there's no additional variance to expect. Uh, in expenditures, we expected 82.2 million. We're actually going to be just under 82.5. A change of, it looks pretty small, $211,000. There is a tremendous amount of activity that goes into that number, and I'll show you the details on that as we go on. Uh, again, early in the year, I know that historically, variance on expenditures from beginning budget to the final is typically a little over 3%. Again, because we've had some of that variance occur, backed it down to 2% for forecasting for the remainder of this year. Uh, so I, we've gone from expecting expenditures to be 79.5 million, more likely going to be about 80.8 million for the year. Shortfall then has increased just a tiny amount and Fortunately, the anticipated spendable fund balance, which was estimated before we had gone through the audit, actually did increase somewhat. And so with that taken into account, as well as uh, some of the changes for 13-14, we probably are going to end the year <coughs> with about a third of a million dollars more in fund balance than we anticipated when we adopted this budget. And so that would represent just about 10% of our now, here's what happened to make that take place. Uh, for the last two years, we've been carrying in the budget a prior multiple years Medicaid reimbursement that was to flow from the state of Michigan to the Midlands County ESA and then on to the locals. Uh, there were a number of reasons why that process took much longer. So every year I'd put it in the budget at the beginning of the year and then take it out at the end of the year. This year, I didn't put it in at the beginning of the year, and my reward was check arrived in December. <laughs> so we do have an addition of 588,000. That is a one-time revenue. Very helpful. It's paying for some expenses that were incurred going back all the way, I believe, as far as 2009. So it's in the column for one time. It's not being carried forward into my projection. MIPSERS stand for the Michigan Public Schools Employees Retirement.
retirement system, and there is an unfunded liability rate stabilization categorical that the state put into the State School Aid Act when they adopted it late last May. Uh, we weren't real sure exactly how that was going to work because it was going to be tied to uh, our payroll for the year, and of course that wasn't going to be completed for state purposes until September. It's all said and done, and we know that that's actually $915,000 that we budgeted. Uh, the flip side on that, you see it's got a C after it. There has to be an equivalent expense in the expenditure budget. And the way that that works is there's a line item in Section 147C of the State School Aid Act. It appears on our monthly state aid payment, and then a couple of days later we get a bill and we send the very same amount back to the state. Uh, that is being carried forward uh, both on the revenue and the expense side for 14-15. We've been very, very fortunate on IB primary year program and some Looking Sharp and some music, or music uniform grants. And we've received $952,000 more than we had originally budgeted. Uh, we are not spending that all this year, and that was not the so these are intended to cover expenses in multiple years. That money will go into fund balance, and then it will cover expenditures going forward. Some of it will be spent this year. Uh, but we certainly have no reason to expect that we're going to have gifts of the size that we did this year. Uh, if you give me just a second, I'm going to pull up my revenue sheet here and give you an idea of what the actual number on those were. Uh, IB, we had budgeted 250000 and the gifts actually came in, uh, they're at $1,127,000. Uh, and then the Looking Sharp was a $75,000 gift, $75, grant that a local funder provided to give to us in lieu of putting it into the, the program fund of the Community Foundation. Federal Title I, Title II money, came in higher. We're always instructed to budget at about 85% of the current year allocation. Uh, and then in most years, that number actually ends up being somewhat larger. Of course, it comes with an equivalent expense. So federal dollars aren't permitted to supplant any existing expenditures. They will come with their own set of new expenses. Uh, athletic gifts also are up this year. And again, no reason to carry them forward. Uh, it's always, you know, hate to use the cliche, but we don't look a gift horse in the mouth, and we know that we were very fortunate this year that the, we had some pretty sizable gifts come in to support the athletic program. And then the per pupil foundation due to changes in enrollment ended up being uh, down just under a million dollars, and that is because enrollment came in about 130 students lower than we budgeted. Uh, now, unusual year for us because for, for the first time that I can remember, we did not see any drop off in enrollment from October to February. And so I don't know, typically we would have 60 or 70 students that we would drop in that time period didn't happen this year. In fact, we ended up being up by one student. So very anomalous year, but it was fortunate for us because this is the year that the state changed the blend. Instead of 10% of last February, it was 10% of this February. So really, the number that we had in October has ended up carrying forward for us. So yeah, I'm not sure, talked with uh, our enrollment consultant and he couldn't find any plausible explanation. He and I both looked at a lot of the same things. It just seemed to be a, a one-year anomaly. We, we decided that we would agree that maybe this would be the year that we would follow the alien abduction theory. <laughs> <laughs> it was as good as any. Uh, so we have about 200000 in ongoing revenues that will carry forward for next year. And then uh, almost $1.6 of that increase for this year was uh, just a one-time. Now on the expense side, 
we have been able to reduce our staff costs by about six hundred fifty six hundred fifty thousand dollars and that's been primarily through attrition we had some positions that we had budgeted for that we determined that we were not going to fill we've had others that became vacant through this year and again we determined that we were not going to fill them uh, so we were able to begin reducing staff costs well before uh, we got into the next budget year uh, we also when we realized that enrollment wasn't coming in decided that we needed to eliminate the planned bus purchases it's about half a million dollars uh, there you see that Mipser's unfunded liability rate stabilization amount equivalent to the revenue. That had to be added into all of the benefit accounts. Uh, federal grants had to be increased equivalent to the uh, revenue. Technology infrastructure grant, and some of that may end up being carried. That is under both the governor's and the Senate proposal, that number is being protected for next year, but we may not expend all of this. So in the June budget, I may come to you and that some of this may be carried over into next year because we carried over some of last year for expenditures too. Uh, then of course those athletic gifts came in for a very specific purpose that was increased. Uh, our property and casualty insurance took a pretty good jump, $32,251 above where we had budgeted and I think that was equivalent to what we had last year. And then I just showed a, a small increase in what we budgeted for IV and PYP. Uh, obviously that was more than covered with the grants that have come in for this year. Uh, so we were able to, if you net everything out, expenses only went up 155,000 for ongoing and the one time of 40,000. So what we're looking at as we go forward into the future, and I'm going to shift a little bit here because there's not much more to say about the 13-14 year. We only have three months left in the fiscal year. Pretty much all the spending decisions are done, uh, but we are setting ourselves up for our next round of budgets, and we know that we can expect some continued enrollment decline. We're looking at the numbers Today, uh, we have a little over 500 in kindergarten. Let me be more specific. Uh, 523 in the kindergarten headcount, and the grade 12 headcount is 639. So you could do the math, that's 116 students. Uh, there's nothing in birth rates that would indicate kindergarten is going to be too much different from that 523, so we know that we could expect to lose some, some additional students. Uh, this is also another year where kindergarten eligibility rolls back one month. Uh, a year ago, in order to be eligible for kindergarten, a child had to be five by December 1. This year, that was rolled back to November 1. Now, when I looked at our enrollment figures, we didn't have a lot of students who were born in that late November time frame. Uh, but what I don't know is if the parents who had September or October children decided that, well, they didn't want their child to be the youngest in the class, and so should they hold off? We, we really don't know. That's anecdotal information. Uh, but this year is the second of a planned three-year rollback. So for this year, a child will need to be five by October 1 to enter kindergarten, unless the parent requests a waiver, and then next year by September 1. So we've got three years where we could see some unusual fluctuations in kindergarten. Uh, then we have the one-time revenues that have come in that we know won't be in the budget. We do have our agreement with the MCEA, the Teachers Union, where we have a salary adjustment formula. And part of preparation of the mid-year budget is that I run all those figures through the teacher formula to determine what it looks like it's going to be if we were to end today. If all of these numbers came uh, to be as, as estimated, what would the effect be? Uh, and then we do know that we have savings from staff retirements. We had a larger than average number of teachers who are retiring this year, and that always is 
save this money in two places. One is in a period of declining enrollment. We don't need to replace everyone who retires. Uh, and then the second is, is that there's a pretty sizable gap between the compensation for an experienced, retiring, probably 30-year veteran and someone who's coming in at the very beginning of their career. So even if we do end up replacing someone, there can be a savings of forty or forty-five thousand dollars on on the single position. Uh, before I go forward with that, uh, are there any questions on the current year adjustments? Because uh, my next step is to show you what all that means as we go forward. Okay. No. Seeing none. Okay. Uh, let's start with the enrollment and. Uh, we work with Fred Ignatovich, Dan Fred's consultant, who's worked with us for years and years and years, and has at this point probably two decades worth of our data that he has tracked. And using his figures and what I know about that gap between the, the kindergarten and the senior class, it looks like we will go from a blended count of 7,790 down to 7,639 for the next year. And you can see that most of that drop is at the secondary. And Mr. Verlindi and I were looking at the numbers today, and that is primarily going to be felt this year at the middle schools. There's a, the, a discrepancy between the eighth grade moving to ninth grade and the fifth grade coming in. The incoming ninth grade isn't too far in size from the graduating senior class. However, the exiting eighth grade class is quite a bit larger than the incoming eighth grade class. So that, that's where that's going to be felt uh, primarily. And quite honestly, the uh, Mr. Dr. Ignatovich does a five-year projection for us, which we'll look at at the board budget workshop. And we do expect enrollment to continue to decline over the next few years as the elementary and now the beginning middle school classes work their way up into the, the secondary. Uh, we probably aren't too far away from where every class in the district will be uh, in the 500 range, between five and 600. And to put that in perspective, a few years ago we had one class that was going to be that was over 800. So natural attrition. And you can see, I always like to go back to 0102 because that was one of our peak years, one of our more recent peak years. And if the estimates are correct, we will have experienced about a 20% drop next year between that year and, and the 0102 time frame. Uh, so at this point, have two proposals. The governor's introduced budget is shown as executive. And then just last week, the Senate introduced theirs. And it's very interesting because when you get all the way down to the bottom line, which you'll see in about three slides, they come to the same place. <laughs> they just do it very, very differently. Uh, if I could take the best of both, uh, it, it would be a, a pretty nice picture because on the governor's side, as you can see, uh, he, is, he produces fewer revenues for the district. Senate definitely would be our preference on the revenue side. And the difference is the governor proposes a foundation increase of $83. He modifies the, in our position, the dreaded 2X formula. Uh, and gives every district a flat amount up to a certain position and then does 2x beyond that. So his foundation increase, at least in theory, is more to our liking. Uh, however, you can see the Senate offers, even using the 2x foundation uh, formula, a $150 increase for middle public schools. Uh, so in each case, that, that's an increase for us. 
Uh, the governor just kept, kept the hold harmless amount where it is, and this was to ensure that every district got at least, I believe it was a $15 increase from 12, 13, or 13, 14. Uh, the Senate has worded it that they want to ensure that every district gets at least a $75 increase from 13, 14 to 14, 15. So that's why it's more favorable to us. Uh, but then you can begin to see where, where and how that comes about. On the governor's side, he maintains all of the categorical. The best practices incentive and the performance incentive, Senate wipes away all of those and rolls them up into the foundation. So on the executive side, there's just a little tweaking there because those are all categoricals that are enrollment based. So as our enrollment goes down, the amount of those categoricals get filled. Uh, then there is another line item, not the MIPSERS number that we talked about that went up by 950,000. There's then what's called the MIPSERS offset. This is section 147A, not C. Uh, the governor eliminates that and uses the money to reduce the retirement rate that we would pay. So you'll see that carried forward on the expense side. Uh, the <coughs> Senate eliminates that and pushes it up into the foundation or into the whole harmless. Uh, both of them, no change in how they calculate students, so the enrollment decrease would be the same. Our multi-year grants that uh, we received this year will carry forward, we don't expect, that Medicaid reimbursement, uh, federal programs, again, I followed the advice and backed out 15% of this year, did the same thing on the expense side. Uh, this, this current year is the final year of an ICT grant that our local foundations have given to the ESA and then it's gone out to local. Uh, and then I estimated about a 1.5% property value increase for the special education and commitment villages. At this point, that, that's pure guesswork on my part based on prior year's experience. We'll know probably before the board's budget workshop what the actual figure is for the county. Uh, so under the executive proposal, revenues would drop from this year's almost $78 million down to $74.5. On the Senate side, a little bit better by about half a million dollars, and revenues would come in at 75 million. So on this slide, we would put a check in the Senate account for this one. On the expenditure side, we would rather put a check in the executive column. Uh, you can see our current expenditures. We have anticipated salary and wage changes, and this is a, a number of pieces all netted together. The MCEA salary adjustment formula is creating uh, a calculation right now that would result in a 2% reduction in the salary schedule for teachers. The formula is written so that it's capped at 2%. It can't go lower than 2%, lower or higher, I don't know how you want to say that. Uh, nor could an increase exceed 1%. Well, right now, the formula is calculating a number much greater than 2%. So the likelihood that there will be a 2% reduction is pretty high right now. The numbers have to change pretty dramatically because it's primarily a revenue-based formula. And uh, the two teams worked pretty carefully on it. A lot of these one-time things don't go into play in the formula, uh, nor do any expenses associated with um, so we have the salary adjustment formula. I have at this point been able to step the existing staff. I have retirement savings from those positions that we know for certain we're not replacing. And then we also have been working on administrative reorganization. So those are just the known pieces. We're continuing to work on improving that number. So I expect that next year we'll actually see greater savings as we go forward into 14-15. But from where we sit today on March 24, it looks like we'll have about a $1.4 million reduction in our current salary and wage costs. Uh, on the benefit side, there's a lot of pluses and minuses there because we pay, as wages go down, the percent of wages then that, are, that we pay on FICA and the MIPSERS 
or that amount drops as well. Um, however, on the governor's side, Snipsters is reduced. On the Senate side, it is increased. And so here you can see where they're making up for some of that money that came out of the, the revenue side and the federal program. So under the executive proposal, if I were to do the budget today, it'd be about 81.3 million and Senate 81.9. Now we have a third component to come into play here. We have not yet seen the House introduce their budget. And then we also have, through the various professional organizations, a proposal that we'd very much like to see get some traction out there. I don't know whether it will have any luck in the House, and maybe that would be what we should introduce. But there's a third piece here that we don't know what it will look like. So we don't make any decisions at this time of year based on these numbers because once we have the House, then all three parties have to begin to work on, I think what Mr. Wasserman described as a sausage making process. <laughs> and it just grinds along and everybody compromises and a lot of change takes place. But this is based on what has been introduced to date not necessarily what it will look like when we get to here. Linda? Yes. It's a ticky-tacky technical detail on your number. With the retirements we're having and having a younger staff potentially in replacements, I assume that's all been factored into what you think the MIPSERS would be, so there's not going to be even a little more savings with the governor's proposal with the change in personnel? Uh, um, <laughs> let me rephrase it. <laughs> if. Is, it, is that because of the changes in the pension plan? No, because... Assuming lower salaries for newer lower employees. Salaries oh, that's, yes, that's factored. You, you factored that, yes. okay. Yeah. So we're seeing a full benefit of that MISPRS yes. reduction yes, from absolutely. the executive. Yeah, I, that's why I, I work with the two <coughs> together uh, because okay. that also reduces what we're paying out in FICA. Okay. So lower wages, uh, replacing uh, exiting staff with lower cost staff. Okay. All of that factors into... And so those are the net figures that you're seeing there. That's 575 or the 1.1 million. So if there was no House proposal and these two came forward, we're relatively indifferent, right? I mean, really? there's no strategic thing mm -hmm. yeah, either, uh, right? Really, uh, in, a, in just a second, you'll see I, the two proposals come within just a few thousand dollars of each yeah. other. Huh? It's just interesting because I don't think I have ever seen two proposals produce such similar results. Typically, we've had a very strong preference for one or mm -hmm. the other, and that's not the case this year. They just get to the bottom line in completely different ways. Uh, and this is what it would look like today uh, based on what you saw with the 13-14 budget. Looks like we'll start with about 8.3 million in fund balance. Uh, the operating shortfall is the paper difference between those revenues and expenditures. You can see uh, $8,000 difference between the two. And at this point, going back to the typical historical variance of about 3.5%, so you can see that if we had to draw the budget today, we would be eating up a pretty sizable amount of fund balance probably ending the year between right around 4.4 million and dropping to 5.4 percent of expenses. So we've got a lot of work to do. This is not the budget that you'll see when you talk about it at the Board of Budget Workshop. This is just the, the starting point based on what we know today. And we know that we need to do some work on, on that one. But it is interesting that the two very different proposals get us down to just about the same place. So. Honestly, I, I, you know, unless there's a philosophical desire to increase the foundation uh, as opposed to categorical or something like that, they, they mean the, pretty much the same thing. Uh, so, key drivers, these are the things that we're watching. Enrollment. Uh, odd thing is, is, yes, we're estimating enrollment today, but because of the way that the blended count works with an October and a February count, 
We won't know that number for certain until next year at this time because the current February count was not finalized until March 18th. That was the date that Stephanie said. So I now know what our, our February count was. So at this point, it's purely <coughs> it's before the students show up. And even when they do show up, we've got that uncertainty about what's happening during the, the course of the year. Is that something that there's been no discussion on? Like you expect that that will be the same way that's calculated next year at this point? Uh, yes, I do. Because neither the executive nor the Senate included in their proposed act a change to that. Okay. And if there was, it would have appeared. Now that's not to say the House couldn't, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, that doesn't happen, happen separately from the State School Aid Act. That, that gets built in as one of the line items on how it's done. So uh, pretty confident that it'll still be 90% fall, 10% spring. Uh, that incident section 25 that allows <coughs> districts to capture or lose a portion of FTE when students move between October and February. Uh, although in our case, I don't even know how many students it was. I'm, I'm guessing it was dozens, if not into the three digits, had a net effect for us of seven. It was added to our fall number. But that's all right. It's better than taking away seven. Uh, so state funding, giving you my best estimates today, we won't know. Uh, we'll have to, depending on whether, you know, where we are in the process, late May, just have to make a call on which one looks most likely. And then we don't know for certain until the state school aid is, is passed. Uh, some years that's early, late May, early June. I've sometimes been making tweaks to the budget just before it gets passed and mailed out. Uh, other times we have not had anything even as in October and there have been changes in November. And the good news recent history has been more positive. There's been a lot of uh, dedication on the part of the legislature to try to get it done early because they realize that it just leaves districts in a terrible position you are required legally to have your budget adopted by July 1. That's very, very difficult for you to do with any degree of confidence when you've got the legislature up in the air. And sometimes there are pretty wide disparities between the three versions of the budget. And, and you, you don't know, it's just a, a guess at that point. So last few years, there's really been a desire to get that done. Staffing levels, we'll be working on that over the next few weeks. Uh, and then typically we know when school starts for certain. There's generally some changes. We have staff coming and going over the course of the summer. I, I'm not a betting person, but I'd be willing to bet that there probably will be people who will come in in July or August and say, hey, I'm moving, I'm getting married, and now we have a vacant position. And we may, uh, you know, may or may not fill it or we may need to add sections. Our MTA contract formula, at this point, I will not be doing anything more with the estimate because it'll be based on our existing budget. And we'll know for certain what that number will be after we've gone through the audit. And our auditors uh, will be presenting to you, I believe the date is September 8th, the first board meeting in September. We typically know that number in advance. So we'll, we'll know before we start the school year where we are with that, but for budget purposes, I'll be budgeting a 2% reduction. Uh, we have our MSESPA contract, and that's our, our grounds and maintenance group, and that expires this year, so I'll make an estimate before the board budget workshop next month, but we won't know for certain until we've ratified that part. Uh, our paraprofessionals contract is in place through June 30, 2015, so we can estimate those costs with a pretty high degree of certainty. At least we know what the wages are, we just don't necessarily know what the FTE will be. And then unaffiliated staff wages, we'll be doing the estimates on that in, for the board budget workshop, and we'll know for certain in May because that will be what will be coming to you in your salary level. Retirement cost is tied to staffing and the State School Aid Act. And we don't know.
know for certain until the year has completed. And part of that is, is that newer employees have some choices and they may go into different elements of the retirement system and they have matches that they, they may select. So it's up to them what they select and then we're caused to match. The figures that I give you are pretty much an average across the group. There, there's not tremendous variation yet. As more and more employees enter into some of the newer programs, there could be more variation as we go forward. But right now, you still see this as a single number. Uh, the cost of medical, again, we'll estimate next month. And because we're still funded, we not, won't know for certain what that will be until we've actually gone through the year. And then we have the monies that come through the ESA, the Act 18, the Special Education Millage, the Medi uh, Medicare amount, Enhancement Millage, as well as I should have put up there, there's tuition that they charge us. That's on the expense side. They will be bringing their budget to you in May, so that'll include the numbers that I use to, to build the budget for you. Uh, and then we should know for certain sometime next year when they do their available fund balance will be estimated. I have an estimate for you now. I'll revise that when we do the final budget revision in June, and then we'll know for certain after we've completed the audit what that amount will be that, that will be available. So at this point, I will entertain questions, and after that's done, we do need to act on the proposed revisions for 13-14 because they have to be our website and they're transparent in the Any questions or comment? I just I just have one. I want to applaud the current year efforts at reducing the cost in this current year to buy us time in the out years. And while one of those elements was, was bus deferments and they are only deferments, it does help buy time. So I applaud looking under every rock that we're doing to, to do that. And uh, Linda, the February count, you know, the, I, I just want to be optimistic about that. Is that, a, is that telling us something? Or is it just truly just an anomaly? I, I sit there and go, that's interesting that we didn't decrease when we decrease every year. I, I, because it's just one point in time, and I've never seen that before. I don't know don't to what to make of it. But when it came on the heels of a larger, larger drop decrease than yeah. we had projected, I wondered, did people just leave earlier than they would have? Okay. I, I, I don't know. We, yeah, we, we have hundreds of students who come and go in their time. Mm -hmm. And it may net out to a, a drop of only 60 or so, but they're tremendous numbers okay. in, in and out of the community. So I, I don't feel comfortable drawing a conclusion okay. from it and saying, yeah, I think that's going to be the wave of the future because I, I don't know whether it's connected to what happened in the fall or not. Yeah. Well, the good news is, even if it's an anomaly in a one-time event, it helps us it's, for next it's year. It's definitely mm -hmm. to right. our favor. Yep. Any others? I was just going to add one thing. It is nice if uh, if some of what Jerry had spoke about as far as uh, you know keeping costs under control is through attrition. It is nice if uh, if we can use retirements and things like that so that people are affected minimally. This is a nice if it, if it's the choice is available. It's nice minimize impact on our uh, our working groups. Okay, with that, I'll entertain a motion for accepting this current year budget revisions as Linda Linda indicated. I move approval. Oh, did you okay. go ahead? I'll move approval of uh, the mid-year budget adjustment as uh, presented today um, by Linda Klein. Should I support. accept your support? Certainly. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Kaminsky and, and Ms. Uh, Branstad on the support. Uh, any other questions we asked them before the motion? But seeing none, uh, we'll do a voice of vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? You guys have it. Thank you, Linda, again for the Excellent, and I'm expecting the same out of Bob next year. <laughs> <laughs> Except maybe he won't clear the room. <laughs> okay, uh, with that, we move to our superintendent with an administrative appointment. 
I am recommending the Middle Public School Board of Education approve the employment of Mr. Brian Vutin as Associate Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. As of July 1st, 2014, Mr. Cooper will transfer an Associate Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment to Associate Superintendent of Finance, Facilities, and Operations upon June 30th, 2014, retirement of Linda Klein, the current Associate Superintendent of Finance, Facilities, and Operations. Mr. Bruton graduated from Defiance College of Ohio with a bachelor's degree in science in May of 2008. He earned his master's degree from the University of Illinois in May 2011. He earned an educational specialist degree from Oakland University. Mr. Bruton is a high school graduate of Utica Ford High School. Mr. Bruton has been employed by the Elginet Community Schools under my employment as a teacher, athletic director, assistant principal, principal, and interim superintendent. Mr. Bruton's responsibilities included the transforming of the Elginic High School into an IB World School, implementation of the one-to-one -one technology program, implementation of data director as a district-wide um, warehouse, implementation of EPASS, a, a progress monitoring system, experience with at-risk students and increasing in performance, and he has uh, increased the district-wide graduation rate by 7.6%. I think these experiences align extremely well with the Midland Public Schools initiatives and challenges of the future. I've obviously had the opportunity to observe Mr. Bruton's professional work during his career, and I um, strongly recommend that we appoint Mr. Bruton tonight. With that, I'll accept a motion. So moved. Moved by, by uh, Member Baker. Any in support. In support by Mr. McFarland. Any question or comment? We did get to meet him when we were in Algonac. Yeah, but those of you who visited mm -hmm. obviously yep. would have met him down there. Yes. So. Yep. I don't think my former district's real happy with me, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think they knew there was a possibility of that happening. So. Well, and, and Mike, I would comment, I, I like the approach in terms of criteria, what you were looking for in assessing those experiences that we need. I mean, the IB implementation of PYP and potential other things we're thinking of down the road and the one-to-one -one computing challenges we have ahead of us and our ever-growing at-risk population and, and fixing some of these things that, that traditionally we've lost in the averages. Uh, he brings a lot of those experiences that, that are gonna be necessary for those three key things, so I'm, I'm pleased with that. Any others? With that, uh, we'll take a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you and welcome. Yes, and, and he sent you a letter tonight because yeah. obviously he's running a board meeting tonight mm -hmm. as, you, as we go. He's probably finishing ahead of us, I think, maybe, but um, so you'll meet him in person soon. Okay. All right, great. And uh, we'll move on to, uh, oh, we got finance again. The, for gifts, oh. do I have that right? Mm -hmm. Minutes from our meeting. Oh, minutes, I'm sorry, John. I'm sorry, okay. FFO minutes. Here, here we go, it's less than a page, so. I think we'll do pretty well. Uh, myself, uh, Ms. Branstant, uh, Mr. Wasserman, Mr. Sharp, Mr. Verlindy, uh, Ms. Klein, uh, Ms. Lux, and Mr. Cooper was present for the meeting uh, we had in March 17, 2014. Uh, the group welcomed Mr. Cooper, uh, Mr. Bob Cooper on January or on July 1st. Mr. Cooper would become the Associate Superintendent for uh, Finance, Facilities, and Operations. Uh, we discussed some upcoming Board of Education agenda items, the mid-year budget revisions, which we went over, uh, best practices resolution, uh, resolution authorizing Mr. Cooper um, to, uh, to be a signatory on bank accounts, uh, purchase of a new steamer to replace an old one, I think is upcoming in the, uh, today's agenda. Uh, Ms. Klein delivered the good news that the Michigan Court of Appeals ordered the state of Michigan to reimburse participating school districts in the Adair One case for the out-of-pocket ex expenses incurred during the 10 and a half year history of the lawsuit. Last week we received a check for uh, $8,349.82 representing our share of those expenses. Since our February meeting when we uh, discussed the financial reporting changes required by GASB 68, the Office of Retirement Services has provided a preliminary estimate of the net pension liability uh, required uh, pension expense that MPS is required to report on June 30th, 2015. This change is for financial reporting purposes only. It does not result in new retirement costs for the district. Um, and thank God, uh, because our share of the pension liability is estimated as more than 125 million. Um, our share of the expense is just under five million. So. 
right. Uh, Ms. Klein and Ms. Locks reviewed the proposed mid-year budget adjustments. Um, I think we went over that um, in detail with Ms. Klein. Uh, in February, the group discussed the possibility of selling the form, former Mills Elementary site. The district's attorney has provided a sample notice of bid and sale of property that the district may use if wishes to proceed with this plan. Our next meeting is Monday, April 21st, 4.15 p.m. Any questions? What is the benefit of selling the Mills Elementary site? I mean, it's not costing us anything, as I understand. Is that true? Or well, there's always cost attained as far as the maintenance of the ground and but the for facilities. We're not charged with tax on the property or anything well, to that effect. Is that insurance true? on it. Um, the, I think the other piece of that would be the um, deteriorating condition as it sits. Okay. And if you can find a repurpose for it, I think the community out there uh, would appreciate that as well. And so um, I think we're trying to take care of an asset in the district and, and, and get it maybe used, for, repurposed for something. Okay. Well, okay, now I'll turn it over. All right. And I noticed something in the minutes that I should have mentioned in the budget presentation. And that is in order to receive the best practices incentive for this year, and I'll be bringing you a resolution probably at the next meeting, uh, we do have to post our projected 14-15 revenues and expenditures. So that the numbers that you saw today at a very high level, just the revenues and the expenditures will, will be out there as well. Uh, we have some gifts totaling $10,841.61 from the Adams PTO for some teacher wish list items. The East Lawn Student Supplemental Education Endowment Fund at the Midland Area Community Foundation for a science field trip, and that is for third graders to go out on the Apple Door 4. Presumably that will be a little later this spring. <laughs> <laughs> it be a chilly trip Ice right now. Version. <laughs> uh, East Lawn also received Frozen. a grant from the Clorox Company for the SMEC Summer Camp, and SMEC stands for Science and Math Extravaganza for Kids. Uh, that, that's something that they've been able to send students to every year. It's held over at Saginaw Valley during the summer. It's a neat experience. And then the Dow High Music Parent, Dow High Music Boosters Parent Group are providing some support for jazz all within the threshold, so they don't require your action, but we will thank the donors and recognize them for their support. Next item does require action, and we did not put this on the consent agenda because it was not an item that we had budgeted for. Uh, it is coming out of the food service fund, using food service fund balance, so it's not going to affect general fund one way or another, and it is why we have a fund balance in food service. Uh, but we need to replace two connected boilerless steamers for the Midland High kitchen. Uh, actually, I think the replacement units may have boilers because we thought these would be lower maintenance. So this will be a, a, an improvement. And the cost includes the labor and disposal to remove the old unit and placement of the new unit. Uh, we bid these and we recommend issuing a purchase order to the low bidder, Stafford Smith Incorporated of Bay City for a total delivered price of $15,165. Again, this is not a general fund expense. This will be a food service fund purchase. And on June 30, 2013, the fund balance for food service was $88,977. And for those who haven't been on the board for a very long time, uh, it's nice to say that we have a food service fund balance because there was a time not all that long ago where the general fund was subsidizing food service. And now food service is self-supporting and is able to maintain a fund balance and provide for things like this when it needs to replace its own equipment. So the program has turned around and uh, we're, we're happy that it's in that position. So we're asking for your approval. So I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to issue a purchase order um, consistent with action item 5.3. Support. Okay. Got, uh, Mr. McFarland, Ms. Brandstad. Um, any discussion or question for Linda? 
Seeing none, we'll move into a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. And now we'll move on to Mr. Merlinde. Thank you. <clears throat> we have five staff retirement <coughs> for information. Uh, Gay Beebe, teacher uh, administration, works in district wide program. Uh, that's effective June 12th as our next uh, uh, three. Ned Bontrager, teacher of physical education at Plymouth. Andrea Croft, teacher at Hubert Elementary. Dan Simons, teacher at Dow High School. And then effective June 11th, Dan Valencourt, a paraprofessional over at East Lawn. And we thank them for their service in their local schools. A lot of teachers. Gives you song a budget. Yeah. Okay, we move on. Uh, there's a list of uh, correspondence to and from the board on, in the agenda. You'll notice our meeting agenda, and I'll highlight the 3 p.m. April 28th budget workshop that Linda's kind of gives a sneak preview of today. And now we'll move into study discussion session, and I'll start to my right with Angela. All right, just a couple of things. Um, I and I know several of us attended the Booster Bash Friday night, and it was once again a fabulous um, time. And um, another great example of parents working together to help support programs that um, we really needed to help in recent years given the budget. And then secondly, I just wish everyone a great spring break. I think we're all really in need of a break. In need of a spring. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn. Um, first, I'd like to congratulate Susan and Mark again for the Shining Stars. That's just such a nice award and uh, recognizes people who go above and beyond and often we don't, we don't always see those uh, things that they do. I um, attended the robotics competition for a couple hours on Friday and it was just amazing. Dow High did a fantastic job of hosting, but most incredible was were these robots and what, our, what the students were able to do. I, that is way out of my realm of thinking, and uh, it was a lot of fun, um, and I just see a, lot, a big future in all that kind of uh, competition and energy. Uh, the Booster Bash, as Angela said, was lots of fun, and uh, thanks to all the people that put so much time and effort into it, and uh, the students that were cheering us as we entered on that cold, cold night. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm looking forward to spring break, and. Uh, Hope everyone else can have a fun, happy, relaxing, safe, well-deserved. All right. Um, again, congratulations to our shining stars, um, Mark and Susan. Uh, also, I, the three, I thought, remarkable young women, um, Sam, Carolyn, and Elizabeth. It was great to see um, them come out and, and tell us about their program and what they're doing for the community. And uh, kind of sad that we couldn't get to see more of them other than the brief description that uh, we received of other parts of their of their program. Um, congratulations on your appointment with uh, Mr. Bruton. We're looking forward to uh, meeting him in person because I did not have the chance to go to Algonac and, and <laughs> visit with him. Um, <laughs> also, um, what else was I going to say? I can't remember. Oh, the, um, the community school model, this is probably the fourth time between here and Rotary that I've seen that program and kind of how it's evolved and it was great to see their final numbers for their first year out. Uh, just a remarkable job by everybody involved, uh, you know, especially with um, Shannon Blazy, kind of, I think she's spearheading the project. Uh, just really exciting to see those, those numbers and that data. It tells a story of uh, great success. Um, and I guess that's it, I'll pass it along. Well, I just want to echo what Scott said about the uh, presentation, the three young ladies. I was so impressed, too, uh, not just by what they're doing, but by the poise they exhibited when they told us about it. Yeah. I thought that was amazing. Um, <coughs> and then also the people from East Lawn, uh, that just amazes me. I just can't get past that. And I think what really, really amazes me the most about that is we look at all the numbers and we feel so good about all of this. But for the kids that are involved, this really w can change their lives Absolutely. forever. And I think that is just really the greatest part about it. So congratulations to all those people at East Lawn for their success. And happy spring break to everybody. I'm not having a spring break myself <laughs> this year. So I hope you all enjoy yourselves. <laughs> My break is when they're not on spring break. Yeah, yeah I, that's probably got to be on the, a lot of students' mind is uh, being through the, uh, the, the long winter that we've had. I think they're ready mm -hmm. to go. And um, 
I wonder how the teachers and their administration is going to keep kids focused for the next few days as they uh, get ready to head out. I mean, it's got to be a challenge. Um, I enjoyed the presentations. It's really nice to see a lot of that centered on student achievement and the achievement of our staff. And it's just really neat to, uh, to see the great things that communities are doing and community driven, uh, especially with the community school model. It was uh, really is just a, such a great example of how no matter what our financial situation, no matter what um, our at-risk kids are looking like in the community, no matter what our economy is, it really shows us that we can be successful and uh, look at the collective talents in the community. It's really many examples of that at today's board meeting. On to you, last but not least. I agree with all of you. <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to the spring and the snow leaving the baseball fields and the softball fields and seeing the soccer teams out there. And uh, I hope we can get some seasons in when we come back from spring break. <laughs> <laughs> How long is spring break? <laughs> Not long enough. <laughs> a couple days. I'm uh, on spring break when my kids are actually in school. So <laughs> yeah. um, stay at home dad works I'd like to thank all the volunteers for the robotics competition. That took a lot of effort, um, and it was incredible. Um, as an engineer, I, I was... I had underestimated how incredible that was really going to be. And, and, and John, for your volunteering at the younger age and, and inculcating that, thank you. And I challenge those watching who are not watching, who are uh, retired engineers from Dow and Dow Corning, if you ever wanted to find a way that I know you will be fascinated with by getting in the educational process, they can use mentors. So uh, please feel free to volunteer. And uh, you can call Cindy even, and she'll direct you to the right people. <laughs> Aren't you glad I volunteered you? Um, and, and a thanks for all the people that work the Booster Bash, the, the volunteers again. You know, th th that takes a lot of volunteer effort, the planning, the committee, even the people greeting people. I love the kids out front. And uh, also thanks to all the people that uh, donated by uh, doing the raffles, et cetera, et cetera. That's what makes the money, and uh, thank you for doing that. And I hope the public saw that tonight we had two wonderful illustrations and examples of what Midland Public Schools can do for your kids. Um, you know, the IB program is sitting there teed up and ready to be exploited by parents. I hope you saw that and hope you get the up and, and think seriously about guiding your children at younger ages as they go there. And after they have a, it, the, the coming years, the uh, primary year program, maybe you'll s more people will see that. And, it's, it's just a wonderful program, and I'd like to see more people take uh, advantage of it. And the other post child's the other extreme for our at-risk kids and what we're doing uh, somewhat uniquely, or at least fairly quickly, to intervene. And as Yvonne said, that's life-changing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not incremental improvement. That can be life-changing for some of these kids. And not only their kids, but maybe their siblings as, as the parents come along. So uh, I hope folks see that and uh, see what we have to offer and take advantage of it. Thanks. I wrote to you about the Midland Community Success Panel that um, um, I think it's mainly spearheaded up by the Midland Area Community Foundation. Um, they've asked us to be participate and be one of the participating members of that group. Um, at this point, they've hired a consulting group called NOVAC that will do the study and how we can make the community uh, set a plan forward going forward to make the community better. And maybe more importantly, I wrote also wrote to you about the Midland Local Development Authority, Smart Zone and um, make sure you're clear on that piece of that they do capture the state education tax but we are held harmless on that and so yeah, I think you're going to hear that out there eventually and, and, um, and it doesn't hurt us it's going to help um, our area in fact it could promote obviously um, tax dollars going forward for us with the enhancement milch and, uh, and other tax opportunities so um, they there's two representatives have to be on that from the school district and at this point Linda Klein and I are the two representatives for the school districts. So we are there at the table as well. Um, weather related work day, we've been able, unable to uh, nail that down. We thought maybe we'd be bringing something to you tonight um, in regards to April 21st being that uh, makeup day, but that does not look like it's going to occur. And I think Gary is going back to the table tomorrow to see if we can't um, make some movement on so we can announce the makeup day that we need to still make up. Last week was quite was quite an event-filled week. I wrote to you about that, and I think you've sp spoke enough tonight about some of the events that occurred, as well as the Booster Bash and the robotics and some of the great things that were going on out there. Um, I think we answered the question on Mills Elementary, um, so that was on there, um, about Mills being potentially up on the market to see if we can repurpose that building instead of having it uh, just sit there. 
Um, tomorrow we are meeting with French and Associates, so you approve them as our architect going forward to do the building study, and tomorrow we will finalize um, our contract with them and begin meeting to begin to plan how are you going to study our facilities and then uh, take that study to the community. That's all I have. Okay, anything else for the good of the order? Seeing none, we stand adjourned.